Good morning and welcome to Crossroads with George Cavour. Live casting this morning from Westchester in Pennsylvania. I'm in the home of my cousin Sajjan Abraham or Matthew Abraham and his wife Carmelina. And I came here last evening to have a wonderful time of fellowship and a great dinner with other members of the family. The house looks very festive and I love coming here because there are beautiful angles from which you can look at works of art and Sajjan and Karma keep their house very neat and beautiful. Hi Victor, good to see you. How are things in Inuvik with you and I hope you had a good time on Christmas with you and your congregation. Get on board, folks. The fair is cheap and all can go. The rich and poor. So good to welcome each and every one of you to Crossroads. And as we come to Boxing Day, a day to just sit back and relax. Enjoy time with family and friends, eat the leftovers, clear up the mess. Yes, there's room for many a more. Welcome to Crossroads. And sing forevermore with Christ and all his army on that celestial shore. Get on board. Get on board. Praise God, there's room for many a more. Today, the 26th of December, called Boxing Day in Britain and in Europe, the day when the Lord of the Manor would give gifts to his staff and those who worked on his estate. And so all the leftovers and little gifts would be given to the servants of the household. But it was also a day when families could just take a deep breath and relax and sit and chat without all the activities of Christmas. As we come into the Lord's presence this morning, remember from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Amen. The Lord's name is to be praised. Why? Because from the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord is glorified by his creation. The psalmist says, your faithfulness is as sure as the sunrise. Your faithfulness is as sure as the sunrise. Chandra Mohan, nice to have you with us. And so this morning, even as we come together, I want us to thank God for all that he has been doing from the time of creation. As I look at this whole season of Advent and the season of Christmas, I want you to think of the following P's. The first P stands for promise. God has promised humankind from the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 that he will find them a deliverer and that he will rescue his people from their failures and their folly. Then we go on to the destruction of Sodom and uh, Gomorrah. We uh, have the flood and Noah being given the promise of the rainbow and the covenant with Noah. And then with Adam and uh, then with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. 
always delight in telling my friends from Europe and in North America that Abraham was an Iraqi. He came from Iraq, from Ur of the Chaldees. And so we must show respect to the people of Abraham's tribe from Iraq. And um, God made a promise to Abraham that if Abraham responded to the call of God, that he would be blessed. And the deal was you obey, you honor, you love, and you live loyally to the Lord. And the Lord will protect, preserve, promote, and provide for all your needs. Hi, David, and hi, Irvin. And so this morning, this Christmas Boxing Day, I want you to remember the P, the P of promise, the promise to David and to his line. Then, of course, the next P is the prophetic. God has been revealing himself, speaking to his children, and God delights in revealing his purposes. God delights in making known his plans and his purposes, and so he communicates through his prophets. The prophetic ministry in the church is a neglected ministry, and the prophetic is um, a dual-fold ministry. The first dimension of the prophetic is foretelling. God reveals the unknown. He talks to us and he prepares us by teaching us the things that are yet to happen. Foretelling. Quite different from fortune tellers and palm readers and um, spirit mediums. That's what we are told not to go to, but to wait upon God and to receive his word. And God has chosen people with this unique gift of being sensitive to the voice of God so that they receive the prophetic, the prophetic word of God. The responsibility of a prophet is to simply deliver God's word verbatim to the recipient. The prophet does not add or detract from anything that he or she has heard from the Lord. And so there is a responsibility to speak the truth, to present God's truth about the unfolding future. But the second dimension of the prophetic is forth telling, F-O-R-T-H. Hi, Sandy. And so forth telling means speaking the truth in love, but presenting God's truth to a particular context. So let me give you a contemporary context. The world in which we live is a very divided world. The division between the haves and the have-nots. The division between the insider and the outsider. So many of the trouble spots around the world, around ethnicity, language, and religion. And this surely is not what God wants us. God does not want a divided world. And therefore, when someone speaks for harmony, speaks for peace, brings God's truth and say, you cannot look down on somebody else just because they come from a different part of the world. They too are made in the image of God. That is forth telling, presenting God's truth to our context. And so it's very important that we bring God's truth to our world in our contemporary situation. In India right now, we are having a great controversy about citizenship and who should be included and who should not. And our government, uh, while trying to help persecuted minorities in Islamic nations, um, I think foolishly excluded Muslims because Muslims are also persecuted in Muslim countries because they don't happen to be the right kind of Muslims, you know? And so sadly, this piece of legislation passed, but the people of our country, our secular fabric have risen. And as a result, we are having rights. Now, I do think that when you and I have a right to protest, that we mustn't 
destroy public property. We mustn't destroy the assets of a nation, particularly these are the assets of our future generations. And so I do believe that civil disobedience is our birthright, but that is not a license for destruction of public property. So this is a way of speaking truth into a particular context. Today, I want us to look at a particular dimension that is taken so seriously, and we're going to look at uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, and uh, we're going to read from 1 to 17. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1 to 17. Now, when people normally read text like this, they normally skim over it or even flip over the page. And that's because these are genealogies. And it can sound dreadfully boring for the untutored. Let me read it for you and give you some examples. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, it's interesting that in the four Gospels, Matthew and Luke both present a genealogy of Jesus. One focusing on the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph, the paternal line, but Luke looks at the genealogy of Mary in Luke 3, showing you the physical genealogy through Mary. Now, genealogies have been of great interest, particularly to people in Europe. And for about a hundred years or so, people have been looking at their genealogies. They're trying to discover their roots. They're just trying to discover what their background is. And there are all these DNA uh, companies offering you an opportunity to find out what your DNA is. And uh, these are all attempts at trying to discover what our physical um, roots are, where we come from. Uh, when I came to the U.S., I'm always amazed when people tell me uh, I am Italian, 30%, 40% Irish, 20% French. And I always look mystified because I wonder uh, what my background is. I come from a community called the Syrian Christians of India, and we, our community, are firmly convinced that we are called, given the name Syrian Christians because of various migrations into India. And so there are questions of whether there is Syrian blood in our ancestry, if there's Iranian blood in our ancestry, whether there's Iraqi blood in our ancestry, or even if there are Jewish uh, traces in all of us. It, it's all uh, pretty pointless. But genealogies were considered important because you trace your line through your father. And so it's interesting to look at genealogies. But I want to show you that in the genealogy of Jesus, as presented by Matthew, there are a number of things that you and I should thank God for. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. Voila! We've been able to establish that Joseph is from the line of David. And that's why he goes to Bethlehem for the census order ordered by Augustus Caesar during the reign of Quirinius, who was the governor of Syria. Now, I want us to look at these different people. So, of course, uh, from the line of David, you want to show that you are a child of Abraham. So, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father, father of Perez, Zerah, and others. So, the first thing is 
that these are the children of Abraham. Why is Abraham significant? Because in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and says, Abraham, if you follow me, I will bless you. We will establish a covenant and we have a relationship. Hi, Ram and hi, Henry. And so this morning, I want us to A, put, on, uh, put one take. Jesus was a direct descendant of Abraham. The, he is a child of the covenant through his father, Joseph. Secondly, <clears throat> I want you to look at verse 3. Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, for the first time in genealogies, a woman is introduced. Isn't that interesting? How come every one of us who is born has been born of a woman, but their names are not included in the genealogies? We only trace the genealogies from our fathers. Hi, Rajiv. And so, hi, Bachan Singh Bhandari. And so, I want you to first notice that in the genealogy of Jesus, a woman's name is mentioned. Her name is Tamar. And Tamar is um, a significant person. Uh, Tamar uh, was raped by her, by her father and her brother. And so, there in the genealogy of Jesus is the corruption of a bloodline. She was the victim. She was innocent. But she had been raped. And that is recognized in the bloodline of Jesus. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Now, what do we know about Rahab? We know that Rahab was a prostitute. And that Rahab was living uh, in uh, the city. And when Joshua sent his spies, the spies came in to investigate and to find out about the city before they, the Israelite army came to conquer it. And it was Rahab the prostitute who let the spies in and who arranged for them to escape. Isn't it fascinating that Rahab the prostitute is also mentioned in the bloodlines of Jesus. I'm going to make some points out of all this, even as we look at the bloodlines and the genealogy of Jesus. Rahab was a Gentile. She wasn't a Jew. And Rahab, being a prostitute, was considered a sinner, even according to Jewish religious traditions. And there is Rahab, the Gentile prostitute, who is very much involved in the birth uh, of our Lord Jesus through the bloodline. And then we hear of Ruth, who was the father who is the mother of Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse. Who is Jesse? Jesse is the father of King David. So you can see through the bloodlines a lot of corruption, a lot of imperfections, and tragically a lot of sin. One would have thought that the bloodline of Jesus would have been pure, holy, untainted by any form or shape. And yet, we see in his bloodline some famous failures, some famous historic personages of sinners who were redeemed by God and who were included in the promise of Abraham. Suffice it to say that God can redeem even the worst culprit. So all these 
theories of purity of bloodline go into the bin because the bloodline of Jesus had been corrupted with Gentile blood and with the blood of, of a prostitute. And if God can redeem all that in the bloodlines of Jesus, how much more we must be merciful and generous when we talk about others. You know, we are so judgmental as a community. We are so judgmental. We love to gossip about others. This is one of the greatest failures of close-knit communities, that we have nothing better to do than gossip, slander, malign, and falsely accuse. My brothers and sisters, I'm speaking truth into our community and into the world. This is wrong, and this is not something that you should be proud of. Every time you want to speak about someone, ask the question, is it factually true? Is it kind? Is it something that I could stand up and tell the person to their face in love? If you can't say, do tick those three boxes, then I would suggest that you keep quiet and don't perpetuate falsehood, slander, and gossip. We are people of truth, and we are people who are committed to one another, and we're people who love each other. So, my brothers and sisters, the bloodlines of Jesus, the first 14 generations from Abraham to Jesus, shows us these interesting fallacies. I could read the next 14 and the next 14 till we come to Jesus. There's a lot there that just amplifies and reinforces the truth that I said, that there's a lot of imperfections, there's a lot of weaknesses. But in those first 14 generations, I was able to point out to you Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth, the Moabites. So my brothers and sisters, let us recognize that Jesus redeems all these imperfections. And that is why the angels sing in unison on that first Christmas carol, glory to God in the highest. It's all about God. It's got nothing to do with you or with me. It's all about God. Glory to God in the highest. And peace on earth. Finally, this fractured, divided society has the potential and the possibility of, in Christ Jesus to be reconciled and to be united. Why? Because for today, a savior of the world has been born. See, most of us don't feel the need of a savior. Why? Because we are independent, we are <coughs> autonomous, we think that we uh, can cope and we can solve all of our problems. The whole point of the Jewish law was to show you that you are imperfect, you are not capable of fulfilling the law, and that you and I need help. The law with its perfection shows our imperfections. It's like a mirror. It's showing you that you're physically and spiritually and mentally incapable of fulfilling the law. In other words, the whole world is living in sin. And that we all need redemption. We all need help. And that's why we confess our sins to God, not to human beings. We confess our sins to God. And we seek his grace and his pardon. I have no time for religion. I have no time for the institutional church. But I do have confidence that God has shown us a way in Jesus Christ. He's opened a way out for you and for me. We can connect direct with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus doesn't abandon us, but rather sends his Holy Spirit to comfort, to encourage, to guide, and to lead us into all truth. So, 
This Christmas, can I encourage you to open your hearts and your minds to the Lord Jesus so that he can set you free from your sins because that is his role. He is the savior of the world. But even more, invite the Holy Spirit of God to come into your life, empower you, encourage you, and live life in the Spirit. Overcome your weaknesses and shortcomings and live a life that is pleasing in God's sight. This morning, I wanted to sing a, one of my favorites, not a Christmas carol, but it's called Just a Closer Walk with Thee. And I pray that if you know the song, you can join me as I sing this song. <clears throat> But thou art strong Jesus keep me from all wrong I'll be satisfied as long As I walk, let me walk close to thee Just a closer walk with thee Granted Jesus is my plea Daily walking close to Thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Through this world of toil and snare, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but Thee, dear Lord, none but Thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is o'er, time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely, o'er oh, to thy kingdom shore, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Yes, Lord, we want to live for you, we want to walk with you, and we want you to guide and lead us. As we continue this morning, let's join our hearts and pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of us now and forevermore. Be blessed, stay blessed, but most importantly, become a blessing to someone today. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. In the meanwhile, keep smiling and the Lord be with you. Bye-bye.